Savadi Cup. I learned a little bit of Thai, not too much though. So I interpreted the topic "meet the unmet" quite literally, and I think a symposium is also there to meet each other, to network. And I would like to start with a short task for you, actually. So I'd like to ask you one question: What is the product we sell in tourism? What do we sell? There's an academic definition for that, which is a product in tourism is a bundle of services. That's pretty blurry, I think. In tourism, we talk about hardware. Is it like the hotel you sleep in, the architecture, the bed you sleep in? Is it the airplane you use? We heard a great presentation about this yesterday. Is it the train you use or the taxi you use? That's the hardware. Or is it rather the software? Is it the people you meet, the employees, the experience they provide you with, the smile they have when they greet you, when they welcome you? Is it the food you eat? Well, maybe it's all of that. It's the whole experience, the end-to-end -end experience. And some authors even go that far that they say actually it is about the memories we have. And this was the point I wanted to make with that. And maybe you remember this、uh, 90s action movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Total Recall. Does anybody remember this movie? Yes. It was about memories, right? You could, you didn't go on holiday, but they implant you just a memory of a holiday you went to. What do we have after a holiday? Is there anything we can put on the shelf? Can we put a tourism product on a table and say that's what we bought, that's where we went? It's hard because it's a service. It's not tangible. We use a term called the customer journey, and that means the journey a customer has throughout the whole service experience. And we heard this term quite often yesterday in different presentations. But I want to make it very concrete now and show you a customer journey. To show you the customer journey, you need a customer, and that's why we need a persona or we use a persona. So customer journey means. We slip into customer shoes, and we try to understand the whole experience a customer has. So I'd like to introduce you our persona. It is a colleague of mine, which is Jacob, the designer of this book we just heard about. He's 28. He is from Germany, and、uh, his the quote I like most from him is he always says, "Don't believe the hype." And normally a persona has way more details. So it is really Um, a kind of stereotype of a customer segment, but instead of having it very abstract, very blurry, saying the German tourist, 25 to 23、uh, to 35 years old, you give it really a name and you describe it like a Facebook profile. The idea is that you have empathy with someone and you have an idea of who Jacob is now, even though I try to keep it very simple here. So now we're slipping into Jacob's shoes, and I take you on. Jacob's customer journey throughout his last holiday, and this is going to be a very simplified version, of course, because we don't have that much time here. So, how did this start? Jacob read a travel magazine, and this could be happen on any other channel as well. But he got inspired to go on a holiday, so it could be happen that he、uh, went online on a website, that he watched a TV show, or that he was talking to friends. But there was one touch point, as we call it, where he got inspired to go on holiday. Next, he went to a travel agency to try to get more information about the destination he wanted to go to. Then he went online and read reviews because he really wanted to know which hotel is good there. Where do I want to go to? And I would like to ask you the question: If you go on holiday, if you book a hotel, who of you is using online review websites like TripAdvisor? Hotels.com, Holiday Check, whatever. Just show your hands. And now take a look around. Just look around the audience. How many hands do you see? Isn't that impressive? I'll show you later why we do this. And you're not alone with that.、Uh, a recent study from Germany revealed that 65% of German tourists would never book a hotel anymore without going online and reading reviews of other guests. That's quite a change in the market. And then we book online. Who books online? 
Show me some hands again. Do you remember how that was 10 years ago? Everything is changing right now. Change is a constant. Talking about later. So after these pretty obvious touch points, there's one touch point we often forget. After we book a holiday, we are in our office, we are at home, and we dream about our holiday. We get real pictures in our mind how it will be. This beautiful hotel we know, it's right next to the beach, and we really dream of how it will look like. We have a real clear picture of it later. Then finally the days come where we pack our bags, we go to the airport, we arrive, and the real service experience starts. Not really. We end up at the airport in a long waiting line, and the hassle starts. Everything until here is a pre-service period. So we didn't even have contact with the service provider. We had contact with the tour operator, we booked online through an agency, but we didn't come in touch with one of the real service providers we're going to use later. Only at the moment when we really check in and we put our bags on the conveyor belt, then we have the first touch point in the so-called service period. That is where the service starts. And then the beautiful holiday starts, where we dreamed of the last weeks with this moment. <laughs> you pass the security check. And this can be really, really bad. If you ever through, uh, flew through Heathrow Airport to one of the terminals there, it is incredible. People shout at you, you have to take off your shoes. There's no way where to sit when you take off your shoes. Think about the grandma standing in front of you, taking off the shoes without sitting, putting on the belt, people shouting at you, go faster, go faster, go faster. This is a great start for a holiday, right? I love it. Then we bought the plane. Imagine me sitting in a Thai airplane. It's interesting. <laughs> Then we have the in-flight experience. And I just speed it up a little bit now. We arrive at the destination, we go to our hotel, we check in at our hotel. There could be many more touch points, there could be many more details here. Think about the room, the pool, and so on. We attend diving school, maybe, that's what I did, because I uh, spent some time in Thailand already. But you do some leisure activities there. You dine in a local restaurant, then you fly back home. And then there's some very important touch points nowadays. You post your online reviews. So now think again, what is the product in tourism? How many service providers are involved in that? Is it one product you buy? It's a very blurry thing. So this was one customer journey of Jacob. But I would like to introduce you another one. This is just what we call the story you bought of that. It, it looks like a movie, right? So the customer journey can be very good compared to a movie. A movie is a sequence of scenes. And a customer journey is a sequence of touch points. Touch point is any kind of action where you come in touch with a brand. It can be directly when you check in. It can be indirectly when you talk with friends about it. Or if you go online and check online reviews. It can be completely out of the reach of them when you're just sitting at home and dreaming about your holiday. So now I'd like to introduce you another persona. This is a recap of that, which is Klaus. Klaus is another colleague of mine, and I'd like to show you how the two customer journeys relate to each other. So this moment when Jacob posts his review, might make or break the travel decision of Klaus. It's social media, and social media is really driving the tourism industry right now. If we read good reviews, we might go there. If we read bad reviews, we don't want to go there. And I'll give you two examples for good social media and for a bad one. So an example for positive social media, and you might be familiar with these examples, um, is the story of Joshi. Joshi is a teddy bear. In fact, it is a stuffed giraffe. And the story goes like that. There's a kid, a boy, who forgot Joshi in a hotel. And the boy can't sleep without Joshi. It's a really emotional bonding between Joshi and the boy. So his dad told him the following story. 
You know, Joshi just liked it so much in this hotel. He wants to stay a few more days there, and he's going to come back later. But he likes it so much, he stays there. So just wait a few days, and he will be with us again. And he called the hotel and said, "Look, I have this boy. We forgot Joshi there, and it's really, really important for him. Could you please check if you find it and send it back to them?" And this is what you would expect from a decent hotel, right? That they find your teddy bear and send it back. Well, this is not really what they've done. This is Joshi, and what they've done is they took Joshi on a journey. They put Joshi on the pool and took a photo of him, and they took many more photos and told a whole story what Joshi did in the days when Joshi spent at the hotel. <laughs> Joshi got spa treatment. He made some friends. I really like that picture, and he started working there. That one. And they even made a main name tag for Joshi, so Joshi was now working in the hotel and was responsible, of course, for loss prevention. What happened with this story? So imagine you get a box back with a teddy bear with Joshi in it, and loads of photos like this, and even a name tag. Of course, that story goes viral. He wrote a really nice post on that. It's on the Huffington Post. Just Google Joshi to the giraffe, and you will find it, and it reached thousands of people. And of course, you get a good picture about, a good image about this hotel now, not related to the brand, by the way. Don't forget about this. So this is positive social media, but social media can also go wrong. And I like to give you an example for negative social media. What happens if something goes wrong? And I would like to hear who of you is familiar with the story, because it's quite old. It's from 2009 already. Who knows the story of Dave Carroll and United Brakes Guitars? Can you just show me some hands? Not that many. That's great. So I tell you the story about Dave Carroll. He is a Canadian singer-songwriter, and he was flying from Halifax to Chicago on a United flight. At some point, he saw his guitar throwing outside of the airplane and crashing on the floor. And his guitar was broken afterwards. And for a singer, if your guitar breaks, your tailor-made guitar, this is a real problem, right? So he tried to get at least the money back that he could buy a new guitar. And United just said no, all the time. And he tried it for months. It didn't work. So finally, he said, "Okay, I'm going to do what a singer-songwriter can do. I'm going to write three songs about you and put it on YouTube." And they said, "Yes, whatever, do that. Fair enough." What do you think? What happened? He put it online in the evening. This is just an open complaint letter. What do you think? What happened? Or maybe first, what do you think was the budget he used to produce this video? In U.S. dollars, just just shout out some numbers. What do you think? Five hundred. It was less. It was one hundred dollar. One hundred dollar. He just. These were all friends from him. And they just played it. So he put it online on YouTube, and he went to bed. And next morning, he, he didn't check how it is, but he was called from CNN. Like, <laughs> what's what's going on with this video? And what's the story? And when he would be available for an interview? So after one week, he had three million clicks, three million views on this video, and he had interviews all over the states with that. If you check it now, it has more than 13 million clicks, and it affected the stock price of United. Harvard Business Review wrote a case study about him, and now he's、uh, doing great speaks about about.、It. If you ever have the chance to to hear him, go to him. It's it's great guy. So this is what a single negative experience can do in the age of social media. Isn't that impressive? It all comes down to customer satisfaction. Ever thought about what customer satisfaction is? How can we satisfy someone? Obviously, the case of Joshua was a very positive one, so someone was satisfied. Dave wasn't satisfied. What is it? It's always the difference between expectations and experiences. If our experience matches the expectations we have, we're satisfied. If we don't match them, we're dissatisfied. 
or if we even exceed our expectations, we are delighted. So how does it relate to the customer journey, what I just talked about? Think about this: in the pre-service period, we raise certain expectation towards a service, to a holiday, to your presence today, towards my talk. You have certain expectations, and there are many touch points in which you create these expectations. Be it advertisements, or be it social media, be it word of mouth when you talk to your friends. And then you have experiences, and you continuously match these. And if they are the same, you're satisfied, all good. But what happened mostly is rather this: we raise a lot of expectations, advertisements to sell stuff. But can these advertisements or can the experience hold up to the great advertisement we see in TV? Well, sometimes, but mostly not. Especially in tourism, right? You see always only the best photos on a website. You only see the photos where the hotel appears to be next to the beach, and then you go on TripAdvisor and see, well, it's actually a kilometer. It was just a, just a good photo, right? So if we raise too many expectations, we're dissatisfied. Another problem we have in tourism is if we cut costs, and therefore we decrease the experience, but still promise the same level. That also refers to Um, a negative experience, so to dissatisfaction. On the other hand, of course, if we create an outstanding experience, like the Joshi example, we are very satisfied. We really like that. We're even delighted. We're surprised. And the last way is if we limit our expectations. So if we talk about service design, we're not only talking about the experience, the real service experience. We're talking about the end-to-end -end customer journey. We're talking about which expectations do we raise, and which experience do we provide. We have to understand both sides of that. And we use different tools.、So、I already introduced you the personas, the customer journey, and there are different perspectives on the customer journey. One of that is called the emotional journey. We really try to understand which of these touch points are positive, and which of these touch points are negative. We have to understand that throughout the whole journey. But where do we normally measure customer satisfaction? Online, when we buy something, yes, tools like the Net Promoter Score. And if you buy something, you are asked, "Are you satisfied?" One to ten. Or in a hotel, probably at this touch point. So when you leave the hotel, there's a little questionnaire which asks, "Were you satisfied with that?" Do you normally fill that out? There's a questionnaire in a hotel. Who uses that? Who, who actually filled out a questionnaire in a hotel once? I one, two, three, four, five. There you go. Great tool, eh? Still, everybody has it. Every hotel has its questionnaire, and no one uses it. And we have to understand that for different customers. We have to understand how they perceive certain touch points. What do they think is positive? What do they think is negative? So. To give you one、uh, bold statement, I think marketing right now shifts from advertisement to experiences, and it's not a shift we can we can choose to do. It's a shift social media urge us to do, because people are talking about us anyway. TripAdvisor will post about a hotel anyway, no matter if you use it or not. And this is why we need service design, service design, especially for tourism. But now I'd like to take you on a short detour. So, before I talk about service design in general, I would like to talk just about service and service how I understand it. Because service design is such a new thing still, even though it's in existence for like 20, maybe 10 years,、um, that we still don't have a real definition for that. And I see service in a kind of、um, new way. And I'd like to take a detour now from tourism, going to another industry. Yes. So this is a topic coming from marketing. It's called the service-dominant logic. That's what I'll be talking about. But it's not. I'm going to not talk about it academically. I'm going to make it very hands-on. This is supposed to be an answering machine. Do you still remember that? 
what an answering machine is? If I ask my bachelor students, they don't have a clue what that is. What's that? So it's a machine we had when I grew up next to our telephone. We were not there. It collected the calls. And I ask you, is this a product or is it a service? The answering machine, the tool itself. Who is for product? Just raise some hands, please. Who is for product? Yes. Don't be shy. There's no right or wrong here. Who is for service? That is interesting. All right. So you think a product like an answering machine, a box, is a service? Interesting. What about this? About voicemail on our smartphones. Who thinks this is a product? No one. Who thinks it's a service? All right. So this one is pretty clear, right? My question is: Does it matter for the customer if it is a product or whether it is a service? Does it matter? Because for me, as a customer, it just matters that if I'm not there, someone gets the call, right? So it is a concept uh, proposed by two marketing professors, Vago and Lush, and they said we are moving from a goods-dominant logic. To a service-dominant logic, goods-dominant logic means we produce products like the answering machine, and we sell it, and we get money in return. So this is value in exchange. I give you a product, you give me money. Think about the customer journey for that. It's pretty short, because the relationship ends here. Only if the product breaks, we go back to the producer. But normally, that's it: value in exchange. On the other hand, service-dominant logic means value in use. So, if we use a product, then we pay for the product, and this has big impact on the business model. I'd like to give you just two examples, maybe.、Um, one example is Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce is one of the largest producer for、uh, airline engines for the turbines. So, they used to sell the turbines to the airlines. And、they changed the business model. Now they do it what's called power by the hour. So they get paid for every hour the engine runs.、And、this changes completely on the one hand the business model, but also the relationship between the manufacturer and the airline. Because who is doing? Who is responsible for maintenance now? It's not the airline anymore. It's a producer. But it's a long-term relationship. And the better product is, the longer it runs, the more value is created for both sides. This is called value co-creation. So, customers produce value together with the providers. And to give you an example that, or a quote that this is not some marketing theory, but but real-life practice, I would like to give you the quote of Jeff Bezos when he introduced the Kindle Fire. He went on stage and said, "We don't think of the Kindle Fire as a tablet. We think of it as a service." I'm sure many of you have a mini tablet in your pocket, but if you think back a few years, who of you used a Nokia telephone? Who of you had a Nokia telephone? Just show me your hands. All right. Who, who of you still has a Nokia telephone and uses a Nokia phone? Don't be shy. One, two. Okay, fair enough. I'm not pointing you out.、Um, Who of you has a smartphone? No matter if it's an Android or Windows or an Apple, but who of you uses a smartphone? Yes, all right.、Uh, mostly everybody. Ever thought about how much you use your smartphone actually as a phone? In percentage, how often do you use it to call someone? How often do you use it to text a message, to check your emails, to take photos? To go on Facebook, to listen to music, and so on and so forth. So it is not about the device. It's not that the telephone itself is great. I mean, the Nokia phones were great, right? I could throw it on the floor and it was still working. I tried this once with my iPhone, but just once. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's not about the device anymore. It's what we call the ecosystem. And there was a nice email from Stephen Elov, the CEO. Of Nokia,、um, I think it was two years ago now. He sent this email out to all the employees, and of course, it went online. So I have a quote here. If you're interested in the whole one, just Google、uh, Stephen Elov and Service Ecosystem, you will find it. So he said, "The battle of devices has now become a war of ecosystems. 
where ecosystems include not only the hardware and software of the device, but developers, applications, e-commerce, advertising, search, social applications, location-based services, unified communications, and many other things. Good luck with that translation. <laughs> our competitors aren't taking our market share with devices. They are taking our market share with an entire ecosystem. And this means we're going to have to decide how we either build, catalyze, or join an ecosystem. So what did Nokia do? I mean, not this week, but like a year ago. They tried to join an ecosystem when they started to work with Windows. Well, the latest development I think we all heard in the news this week, right? <laughs> so, this is the end of my little detour. I'm going now from the mobile phones, from the tablets, back to tourism. And I'd like to talk about the service ecosystem we have in tourism. Because it is a very complex thing, right? And it involves, in our little example, our customers. So these are Klaus and Jacob. But it involves also the travel agency, the transportation, the airlines, the hotel, the restaurant, the diving school, of course, the online review website. All these stakeholders. And it gets much more complex. If you zoom into the hotel alone, think about the stakeholders there, talking about employees, about the maintenance, the room service, kitchen, laundry, suppliers, shareholders, authorities, marketing, the community where it is embedded, sales, and so on and so forth. So it can become very complex, but I keep it a very simple example here. So what to do with this ecosystem now? We can map out, we can visualize the relations between stakeholders. So what are the relations we have in our little example? Jacob went to a travel agency, maybe the online one where he booked everything, he was connected to Klaus, to the other customer, through the online review website, and he went to a dive school. So in this very simple example, if you take a look at that, you have to ask, why does he book it himself? Why don't we package that somehow? So we decrease, or we simplify Jacob's customer journey, because he doesn't have to look for a dive school himself, and we can package it and maybe generate more money for the service provider. And this is the beauty of if you um, visualize the service ecosystem. You can understand relationships, you can understand what are the needs of certain stakeholders, and maybe create new context for that. So much talking about service. Now I like to talk a little bit about design. We had some great presentations yesterday I can build on for that. So, in my understanding, service design is not new. Service has been always created, it has been always designed. But it has been designed by different departments, by different silos within an organization. The marketing, IT, design, sales, and so on and so forth. And it was a pretty hierarchical uh, process, like uh, I think John, John was it yesterday in his talk, when he shows what is the process we go through until we launch a product? And in the classic understanding, design was at the very end of this process. It was about making a product look good. It was about making a website look nice. And in my understanding, what is changing right now is the role of the designer. The designer is not there anymore just to um, take care that the product looks good, that we have a nice packaging, or that we have uh, a good-looking advertisement. In fact, service design is very interdisciplinary, and the designer rather becomes a facilitator of this process. Why do we need that? If you think of how many stakeholders are involved in the creation of a tourism or any other service, we are all shaped like a T. We have a deep knowledge in one specific uh, discipline, be it management, design, whatever, and we have pretty broad knowledge across different disciplines. And in our specific knowledge area, we speak our own language. And pretty easy, if you have a problem with your internet and you call your internet provider, you probably don't understand a word, even though you speak the same language. 
at least that's happening when I'm trying to solve a problem there. For me, service design is not just another discipline there. It is rather a common language, a common approach we can use to communicate between each other. It is a process and a box of tools we can use. And the designer is a facilitator of this process. Of course, we still need interaction designer, graphic designer, and so on. But we need someone to take care of the whole process. And this is the process. It's a very simplified example of it. Exploration, where you go out and try to understand what are the user needs, try to gather user insight. But before that, even, you try to understand really what is the problem of your client, and you have to ask and rephrase this problem. You create new ideas, you test them, you prototype, so re you reflect on them. And the last stage is implementation, where you go out and implement that stuff. And when I say it's an iterative process, I don't mean it in terms of years, whoops, of years or months. Oh, you can't see that, but there are always lines going back, so this is really meant to be iteratively. Um, I'm talking about days, maybe even hours, maybe even minutes for iterations. So for creating an idea and testing it and refining that. And this is how it looks in a textbook-like style. This is how a design process looks like in reality. <laughs> it's a pretty messy thing with many, many small iterations. And only at the end, if you have a really clear concept, if you have a really good working prototype, then it's about working out the detail. That is the part in the end. So when I say about iterations in minutes, which tools do we use? I think I've talked enough about service design thinking. I would lie off to talk a little bit about the doing, so about the tools we use in that. And of course, I um, refer to where in the process we can use it. So we start with the exploration. How do we understand a service? How do we create, if we work with an, if we, two different things, by the way. One thing is to improve an existing service, and one thing is to create something completely new. And maybe in the Q&A, we can elaborate a little bit more about that. What I really recommend is to do some self-exploration. So I did some self-exploration of the Thai tourism industry the last weeks here. It was quite good. If you rephrase that less fancy, it was a hot, nice holiday. But I really recommend to go out and experience a service yourself as a designer. But also take the management. I often work with companies where the management never used the service themselves. Ask someone from an airline management if they ever had to book their own ticket and flew economy with the airline. Ask a car manufacturer if they ever had to take care of the car themselves. Mostly they're quite disconnected. So we take them on what we call a service safari throughout their own service experience. We work with ethnographic methods. So we observe a lot. We take a close look at what's happening in each of these little touch points. We do contextual interviews. So we ask in the moment when something's happening, why do you do it like this? Why do you do it like that? Why do you smile right now? Why do you dislike this? But this is, this is hard work, and it takes a long time. And if you think in tourism, where someone is away for a week or two weeks, it's hard to follow someone, do real ethnographic work. I mean, follow a tourist over two weeks, a family. It's kind of sketchy, maybe, even. Eh? So this was a research project of mine. Of how can we do research in an ethnographic style for tourism? And the result of that is called mobile ethnography. Mobile ethnography means you use a smartphone. Nowadays, most tourists have with them anyway to slip into their shoes and understand their service experience. I'd like to show you a short video tutorial we use to introduce the method to customers. You want to help improve services around you, but you're tired of those standard questionnaires that often ask the wrong questions. My Service Fellow is a free mobile app that allows you to give valuable feedback on the go by documenting your service experience at any moment you think is important. We call these moments touch points, and your life is full of them. Imagine you're going on a business trip. 
My service fellow lets you easily document your flight experience. That meal tasted pretty bland. You can also document how you experience finding the hotel. Oh, that was easy. Taxi! Use your time in the queue to evaluate the check-in. Check-in took way too long. Did you find your room quickly? Oh, that was disappointing. Relaxing at the pool? <sighs> Give each touch point a title and evaluate how satisfied you are in total at that particular moment. Document each touch point with text, photos, videos or voice memos and indicate all positive, neutral or negative aspects by tapping on the smileys. Adding and evaluating touch points is done offline, preventing expensive roaming costs abroad. You can review and edit your evaluations at any time and upload all data at once after the service experience. Your data will then be analyzed and will give valuable insights for the improvement of the service. With My Service Fellow, you have a direct impact on the quality of a service. My Service Fellow, your experience matters. So with tools like this, we have the opportunity to slip into customer shoes in real time. And this is not something we should use just once or twice, but this could be really integrated into management. So you get continuous feedback about how you perform, but not in general with the questionnaire, how was it, 1 to 10, but for every single touch point. Whenever something goes wrong, people can directly uh, notice that. Um, this was a research project uh, and my PhD project. It's still free to use. If you'd like to use it, if you have a nice project, just send me an email and I'm happy to set you up with an account. So, personas, we covered that already. Um, as we don't have that much time left, I just jump over that. Normally, in our workshops, we work very co-creative. So we get many people together and we work with pen and paper. So if we do personas in the first sketch, it mostly looks like this. And there are two different ways of how to do personas. One is called data-driven personas, which are really based on research, and one are called ad hoc personas or assumption personas. We just get people in the room who have good knowledge about customers, or you get customers in the room and you create personas with them. Of course, these should be tested later on. Customer journey maps. Um, so this is how it looks in reality in our workshops, right? We use big pen pay templates and post it and try to understand what is the customer journey, how does it look like? And we involve the ethnographers, the researchers, but we also involve real customers with that and do a workshop with that and say, well, how was it for you? Stakeholder maps, so different tools of how to do that, how to visualize the stakeholder maps. And then the next step for that is what we call value network maps or service ecosystem maps, where we try to understand what are the relationship between different stakeholders. This was an example where we work with a car sharing, with a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing network. So you can see here pretty clearly, you have a customer, and you have someone who supplies the car and they exchange this car against money, and then you go into more detail and try to understand what is the relationship and how does it work. We build prototypes, service prototypes. We build them very quickly, quick and dirty. Um, this was an example where I worked in tourism. It was uh, the redesign of um, a new building, pretty big restaurant with like 600 seats, and uh, there was a shop included, uh, there was a ski school included, so it was a huge building. Um, and their main purpose was to become a family-friendly ski resort. So the architecture, the planning was already done, and we just did uh, we, we came in last second to test if this is really family friendly. We just used Lego. So we plotted out the whole architecture and let's play out a customer journey in this building. How does it look like? And I think it took us 10 minutes to realize that this is not going to work, how they planned it. Because they just forgot about the customer, the real experience within the architecture and how it is with children to only walk there from the car park to the building. That was a first bad touch point there. But we use many different ways how to prototype services, and the quicker it is, the better it is. For me, the beauty of a design process is its iterative character. Um, I'm not a trained designer. I was trained 
in a management school. So I studied strategic management. I went to school. I learned doing a failure is something bad, and we should avoid failures. So whenever I did when my work later in service uh, on tourism innovation projects, I always thought when I do a mistake, it's something bad, something wrong, and I felt bad about it. So I didn't talk about that. Just said, ah, don't talk about it. Go on. And when I realized that actually design process is iterative and a failure is something good, you just have to realize that early in the process. Fail early, fail safe, fail cheap. It was like a boy opening a box of tools, and I suddenly had names for that, and I had a process I could follow. And this is something we have to learn in the service industry still: how to prototype service. I think we're just in the beginning of that. There are some great apps for the digital world. If you think some of you might be familiar with apps like Pop App, where you can really prototype on paper, then just take photos of your wireframes. And connect them. You have a prototype of a well click-through dummy within five minutes of an app, and we need more things like that. Service advertisement. As I talked in the beginning, you need to understand both sides. You not only have to concentrate on the real experience of the service, but also on the advertisement part of that. How do you sell something? This was a workshop with the Australian government, and. I like this photo because it really reflects how we do our workshops. If you get government executives in a workshop like this, that they are smiling, having fun, and just doing crazy stuff, this is great. But this also shows the changing role of the designer, being rather a facilitator than only someone who works in his、uh, in his own room on a computer doing nice things, right? So we work with people. It's co-creative, and of course. All the stuff we do has big impacts on the business model, and we can't forget about that. A good designer, a good product designer, knows about material and cost about material. You won't design a car out of pure gold or titanium because it's just not profitable. It wouldn't work. And in services, we have to think, think the same way. We can't design a great service experience which just doesn't work because it's too costly. So we use tools like the business model canvas from Alex Osterwalder to quickly sketch and understand the business model of any service innovation we think of. The last tool I like to、uh, show are theatrical tools. I love to work with professional actors and work with、uh, improvisation theatre tools. These are two good friends of mine, Adam Lawrence and Marcus Holmes from Germany. Some of you might be familiar with the Global Service Jam. Is there any jammer in here? Yes? No? Shout out loud. There was one, right? Okay. I'm gonna talk about that later, maybe a little bit.、Um, so Adam is a professional actor. Marcus studied theoretical physics. We like to call them also Pinky and the Brain. So Adam is the guy on stage. Whereas Marcus is the guy in the background who's analyzing what's happening there, and we use improv theater tools. So we create prototypes, we test them in seconds. We get an interdisciplinary group together across different hierarchy levels, customers, employees, management, and we play out, we act out touch points, we act out service moments, and then we try to understand what goes wrong here, and then we quickly change it. And we just use the tools we have, and through that we iterate and create new ideas within seconds. And it's impressive how far you can get within one day workshop with these methods. So, this is service design, and I, I quite expect the question at the end, like Mark, what is service design? Can you can you give a definition for that? And Chris tried it yesterday.、Um, I can't. I can't give you a definition of it because it's such an interdisciplinary approach. For me, it is a process, a set of tools, a common language, which has a few basic principles. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to go through these five basic principles. At least that's my perspective. How I see service design. First, service design is user-centered. 
That means we put the customer, the user, in the center of the whole service. We try to slip into the shoes and try to understand really in depth how it's experienced for someone. And we rather do it with qualitative tools, mostly ethnography tools, rather than、um, quantitative statistical tools. And let me let me show you why. There's a nice little example for that. Think about a target group, and in this target group, you have two customers. Both are the same age. They're born in the 1940s. Both are from Great Britain. They are both pretty successful in what they're doing. They're very rich. They are married. They have children. They love dogs, and they love the Alps. So this. Looks like a really good target group. Like they would really match. But if you think about this, one of them could be Prince Charles, and the other one could be Ozzy Osbourne. It fits for both, and that's just because we asked the wrong questions. And this is, well, not the problem, but this is what happened if you use only quantitative statistics. You don't really understand what's happening there. You only get the answer for the questions you ask. But in order to ask the right questions, you need some qualitative research before. So this is what I mean with user-centered. The second one is co-creative. On the one hand, co-creative, as I showed you in my little detour of the service-dominant logic, but rather in this sense on how we work in our workshops. We get people from all different hierarchy levels across different departments in one room. We invite customers. We really try to work together, and try to come up with solutions together. So our workshops look pretty messy. There are loads of sticky notes and so on. And we have to take care, if you think of a designer as a facilitator, to create what we call a safe space. So creating a safe space, a space in which people from different hierarchy level feel free to share their objectives. To share their insights, to share their ideas, and only if we create such a safe space, a workshop is successful. I had once a really, really bad experience where I worked with a bank, and there was one senior in the room, and the rest were like middle management. And it, 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 it's already five years ago or so, and I didn't care that much about the safe space then. And the workshop was a complete disaster. Because at the end of the workshop, the senior just looked at me. Well, yes, that's nice, but that's all what we're doing, right? And he just looked at his staff and said,、mm, "Right." And all they say, "Yes, yes, 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 yes." End of the workshop. That's it. No innovation coming on there. And that was just because it was my failure. I didn't take care about creating a safe space, about being a facilitator of this workshop. So this is what I mean about working in a co-creative sense. The third one is sequencing. So I showed you the tool of a customer journey. We understand a service really as a sequence of touch points, like a movie consists out of a sequence of scenes. But the customer journey only reflects what we call the front stage experience. So those processes where the customer is involved. Of course, if you think of a hotel, there are many backstage processes as well, like the room service. You normally, as a customer, never see the room service. You just see that something happened, but you don't meet the people. So you have to understand both sides: what are front stage processes, what are back stage processes, and also we can map them out. We can not only do the customer journey; we can also do the employee journey to understand how is their daily life and how to improve the employee experience. Because, frankly speaking, in tourism, if you don't have a happy employee, It's hard to deliver good service, because at the end of the day, it's all about the smile. The fourth one is evidencing. Services are not tangible; we can't touch them. We can't put the tourism product on a table and design that. But we can add tangible objects to that. Services always happen in a space, architecture. But there are also evidences, and the most important service evidence in tourism. You can find in the bathroom of your hotel. How can you prove that a room service has happened, even though the bathroom is as clean as before? 
That's a symbol for that. It's a folded toilet paper. Right? Even though the room looks as clean as before, and you, you don't see any difference. You see that toilet paper has been folded. So this is a symbol that the service took place here. And in tourism, we love to, to create our own service evidences, even though we don't create them, we don't get them. We love to do it ourselves. Just need to go out on the market scene and see how many souvenirs are sold there. When I go to New York, I come back with an I love New York t-shirt. When I go to Phuket, I probably come back with an I love Phuket t-shirt. When you go to France, to Paris, you come back with a miniature Eiffel Tower, right? So these are service evidences, souvenirs, stuff we love to buy and take home, and we love to put our desk on our shelf just to remind us on that great service experience we had, this great holiday. But we can also deliberately design them. An airline once designed a really nice service evidence, which was a bottle opener. And they could, well, the, it was in the business class, it was a steel bottle opener, looked really nice, and many people took them with them. And they were actually made that people took them with them. Because what happens if you have a bottle opener at home, which looks really nice, the form of an airplane, out of steel, high quality, with a brand name underneath? People use it and friends might use it. And you have an anchor point for storytelling. And you might tell your friends about this. Oh yeah, this was this and that airline. It was a great experience. So if you think again about the customer journey, with such an evidence, you add another touch point. You prolong your customer journey. And this is stuff we can design. So service design, again, is for me rather a common language, a common process, than a discipline. Because creating such a such an object is product design, of course. The last point is being holistic. So holistic in the sense of to really understand touch points with all our senses. Not only what we see and what we hear, but also what can we touch? How does a customer really feel here? How does it smell? How does it taste? And really try to understand it holistically. And on the other hand, really try to understand if a service, if a new service, if an innovation, also suits the company culture, suits the employees. Because if there is a misfit, misfit, it won't work as well. All right. Well, I think that's almost it. Um, if you got interested in service design, there are a few nice books about that. Um, but the service design community is really active on Twitter. So if you'd like to learn more, I really recommend to just look up the hashtag service design. There are a few networks you could go to and find out more about that. There's a good website about service design books and service design tools. And there's one thing I promised to talk about, which is the Global Service Jam. Maybe my, my last venture, just in a few words, because I don't do that much consulting anymore. I rather try now to develop tools um, to improve how we work in service design. And my last venture right now is Smaply, which is a software solution to do customer journey maps, stakeholder maps, and so on, digital. So it's like, kind of like the PowerPoint for service design, if you like to say that. Um, if you're interested in that, just go on the website, smaply.com, to learn more about that. Um, it's not officially launched yet, but um, it will be launched in December, and there are a few beta accounts still available. All right, that's it for me. All I'm left to say is uh, Kopp und Kapp. Great presentation, thank you. Um, I have a question. Do you do service mapping for people that actually work in the service sector? Are you could, could doing you this, the, well, this, the service, you're mapping the customer journey um, and advising on the customer journey. Ah, you mean like so the are, you, are you getting journey? the feedback from the service professionals themselves and using that to build? Yes, definitely. Th th that's what I mean about working in a co-creative manner. And that's, I think Chris covered that yesterday really good. We, we bring together not only the, um, well, we don't design a service for 
a company, right? We only design it with them. So we get together all the different people in our room, not only the customer, but also the employees and the management, and we try to work together. Um, so we, in this manner, we not only map the customer journey, but we map also the employee journey, try to understand where are the connections between them. And um, yeah, we, we do that. Does it answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> How do you implement that, just to follow up on, on that question? Right. Um, I, I don't do consultancy. Right. I, do, I, do, I follow a train-the-trainer approach. So if I work with a company, it's all about building up competence in their company themselves. And I like to ask them in the beginning, do you want to have a taxi driver bringing you from A to B, or do you want to learn how to drive yourself? And learning how to drive means that in the beginning, maybe someone shows you how it works. So in the beginning, we have this agency-client relationship, but over time, it moves on. And my idea is really to build up the competence themselves. Because th this is not something you do once, right? You don't do a service design project, and that's it. Now we have our service, now it's running or done. This is something which needs to be implemented in the organization and constantly checked and rechecked. And this was also why I developed this, uh, this software, to gain real customer feedback, real insights on the go. Um, my idea is that if an organization really, really incorporated the idea of service design, that they constantly improve and check and iterate their service proposition. Um, there's some question from the floor. It says, how do you design services if there is no service in place before? S some services have no sequencing how you deal with it. Every service has a sequence. That's quite simple. Our, our life is, is a sequence. And sometimes you just have to understand that. Um, how do you design services if there is no service? Yes, that is a little bit harder. Because you can't go out and test a service if you don't have a prototype for it. So how do we do that? I learned a lot from agile development, um, from lean startup thinking. And my idea is that you come up with a prototype, an MVP, a minimum viable product. Maybe in that sense, it's an MVS, a minimum viable service. I, I rather like to call that a shitty first draft. Come up with a shitty first draft of a service, of an idea, and then over the process, iterate and make it less shitty. Because if you have a product, if you have an, a prototype, then you can test it, and then you can learn from what's going wrong there. Does this answer the question to whoever? Yeah, I so, but I, think, I think what you're talking about is um, quick and dirty prototyping, yes. just, to, yes. just to get it going. Yes. Exactly. Right. Learn from the failures, learn from the mistakes. But only in order to learn that, you have to do it first. And to do a failure, to do a mistake, you need to come up with a prototype. A, a failure is nothing bad, right? A failure is just a mistake if you do the same failure twice, if you don't learn from it. But, but I guess it's also that may, maybe they don't understand what sequencing is. Maybe it's uh, the experience that happens, good or bad, there is some sort of sequence, yes. right? Yes. So they can also observe that and use that as a platform or, or springboard to actually jump. Absolutely. So it, what I showed here in the customer journey is a very high-level example, right? You can zoom in very, very shortly, and maybe touch points are just a matter of seconds or minutes. So that is a sequence in itself. If I go to one of these little shops on the street to buy some food. By the way, this is awesome. It's the best part of Thailand, the food on the street. Um, even if you think this is just buying a product, it is a service in itself, because there is a sequence, right? I see it. There's some reason why I go to this place. I order the food, which is quite hard for me, but still, I can point towards what I like. Then I pay it, and I get my food and walk away. Even that is a sequence in itself, and that is a service experience in itself, even though what we buy is a product. Coming from um, a tour operator point of view, I was wondering, these days, um, customers are tend to be very, um, I would say, individualized. They like to pick their own um, diving yeah. trips and certain things. Uh, is there a place for a tour operator 
in your opinion, and why would that be? Because it's quite hard to bundle a service together yes. these days. Yes, um, absolutely there is a place, um, but it's changing. Um, it's not so much that you pre-package trips and sell package trips. Because customers go online, they check reviews and say, I would like to have this hotel, this diving, this. But if you think about the customer journey, going online, checking reviews, takes a lot of time. And for a customer, this is, this is actually work. Right? For me as a customer, if I go on a holiday and I have to search for my hotel, for my dive school and so other, this is work. If a tour operator takes uh, this work for me to select products consisting out of the little um, service I would love to have, then there is a place for a tour operator. Um, in the sense that a tour operator takes away work from the customer and I can trust you because you know what my needs are. Does this answer your question? So it goes in the, in the direction of dynamic packaging. Thank you very much, Mark Stickdorn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>